Hello, my name is Bill Bowen, and I am a project management instructor here in Ottawa, Canada. In this video, I want to talk about the Project Charter, which is one of the project management documents frequently used on larger projects. I have given my students the assignment of producing a Project Charter as part of their course, and in this video, I will be providing a high-level walkthrough of that assignment. The aim of this video is to explore a bit about the Charter itself, what its purpose is, and how we use them, and then give some strategies on how the assignment can be approached. Based on my experience in conducting this assignment in the past, I will also be pointing out some areas where students traditionally struggle and, where possible, providing some clarification and guidance as to the assignment's expectations. So without delay, let's get started on exploring the Project Charter. So what do we know about a Project Charter? Many of us have never encountered a Project Charter before, and we might think of it as some kind of preliminary planning document, but this is not the case. A project charter is not an attempt to plan out the project. Instead, it authorizes the project's existence and gives the project manager the authority to commit resources to the project and proceed with the actual planning and execution of the project. I have come to think of a project charter as establishing the framework by which the project will be executed under. The project charter is created within the very first phase of the project life cycle, and within the document, we focus on providing the project manager with enough information to allow the project to proceed to the planning phase. Thus, we are less concerned with defining the schedule or allocating funds to a particular task as we are to, in identifying any known restrictions or constraints on our budget and schedule. We are also less interested in defining acceptance criteria as we are in identifying who will benefit and be affected by the project and what each of these stakeholders' needs and expectations will be with regards to the project. And most importantly, we are interested in ensuring that once we have defined our project charter, all the primary stakeholders agree that the framework we've created will give the project a reasonable chance of success. Once the project charter has been accepted, the project manager will agree to take on the project and the actual planning can begin. As the project charter is created early on in the project's life cycle, there is often not a lot of documentation available to draw upon to produce the charter. I have always found that the primary contributors to the project charter would be the statement of work, the business case, and any pre-existing agreements or contracts that have to be abided by. Beyond these documents, filling in the details of the project charter often falls upon the senior executives within the organization that's executing the project, the project manager themselves, of course, and the project sponsor or client. For simplicity, I usually think of the project sponsor as somebody from within the organization and a project client as someone from outside the organization, although different definitions of these roles exist. Usually you have only one or the other. Sometimes it's possible to have both. It is up to these primary stakeholders, and possibly others, to establish the framework from which our project will be executed. For those of you who have not encountered project charters before, you might be wondering if this process is something new. Not at all. Charters have been around for a very long time, and to understand their purpose and how we use them, let's look at one of the first charters that was used in Canada and examine how they are currently used today. Way back on May 2, 1670, Prince Rupert signed a charter that called into existence the Hudson's Bay Company and gave the company the rights to most of the lands that we now know as Canada. For several generations, Canada was simply referred to as Rupert's Land. Let's examine this historical charter, and by doing so, I hope to draw clear connections between how charters were used in the past and how project charters are used today. By signing the charter, Prince Rupert authorized the existence of the company, much as a project charter authorizes the existence of a project. The charter also defined the purpose for the company, and that was to establish trade between the New World and Europe. The charter also defined the company's objectives. They were to find and trade minerals, furs, and lumber with Europe. They were also supposed to find the Northwest Passage. At the time, people had hoped that there was a navigable link between the Atlantic and the Pacific over the top of Canada. While the company was unable to find the Northwest Passage, they were extremely successful in establishing trade with Europe. The Charter also specified the resources that were at the disposal of this new company. They were given all the lands whose water flowed into Hudson's Bay. At the time, it was unknown just how much land this would turn out to be. 
The charter went on to describe the internal governance of the company. It described what meetings would have to occur and what internal processes would have to be followed. The charter went on to describe who the stakeholders were for the company and what their wants and expectations were. As we can see by looking over this list, the charter went a long way to describe the framework from which the company would operate. And that gives us a bit of a historical perspective of how charters have been used in the past. The question is, how do we use them on projects today? Well, essentially for the same purpose. They are used to authorize the project existence, they are used to allocate resources, they are used to define the objective and scope, the major deliverables, they are used to identify the stakeholders and what their needs and objectives are. Essentially, the Charter serves the same purpose as it was all those years ago. Let's now focus in on the assignment itself. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at the project charter template called for in the assignment. The template is divided into three logical sections. The first section describes the framework for the project itself, while the second section focuses on describing the framework for the project team. The third and final section is simply the sign-off section, where all stakeholders can indicate their agreements with the charter. I will not be covering all of the template topics in this video. Instead, I will highlight and examine a few of the sections, and by doing so, hopefully give you an indication as to the expectations of the overall assignment. The first two topics that you will encounter in the Project Charter are the Project's Purpose and Scope sections. In these sections, the learning objective is to ensure that you demonstrate the proper use of project management terminology and that you can apply it appropriately to your project. The project purpose is a high-level, short, concise statement that describes the desired outcome for the project and what benefits will be derived from conducting the project. Keep in mind you are describing the purpose for the project and not the purpose for the charter itself. The next topic is the project objectives. The project objectives are based directly on the project purpose and should describe the project's outcome in a more quantifiable and measurable way. The project objectives need to be worded in a clear and concise enough fashion that the project deliverables, requirements, and acceptance criteria can all be derived from them within the planning phase of the project. The next section we're going to look at is customer requirements. Remember, customer requirements are produced very early on in the project's life cycle. At this point, the technical requirements or specifications are often not known. Now, most customers can articulate what they would like out of the project, what good or service they would like produced, but they're not always able to specify the steps that will be involved in producing that output. These steps are defined by the project manager and project team later on during the project planning phase. You can think of project requirements as being closer to the operational requirements that need to be fulfilled as opposed to the technical requirements, specifications, or standards. Let's visualize this in the form of an example. Let's visualize this by looking at an example of a cell phone project. Supposing you wanted to develop a new cell phone, one that you could record a message on, select who the message should go to, click a button, and the phone would automatically dial all those people's numbers, send out your message to them, and complete the call. This would be a neat feature to have on a cell phone. When you're describing the feature from a customer's requirement perspective, you're describing it the way I've done it. Just what do you want the outcome to be? What features do you want to be in place? Later in the planning process, you may need to get down to the technical requirements, developing the logic, specifying how the phone will be able to achieve these, this functionality. These would be part of the technical requirements which you would define within your planning phase. The proposed resource list is a very important section. It solidifies the organization's commitment to the project and helps set and clarify the client or stakeholder's expectations for the project. Project resources can come in many forms, including the project staff itself, physical resources such as computers, vehicles, office space, access to shared resources such as time in a lab or meeting rooms, access to people such as subject matter experts or high-level executives. By defining and agreeing on the allocated resources that the project will have access to, the project manager, the organization, and the sponsor or client define another piece of the overall project framework. The organization has now committed these resources to the project and agrees not to reallocate them during the course of the project. 
The project manager agrees that with these resources allocated to the project, there is a reasonable chance that they can make the project succeed. Once resources have been allocated to the project, the project manager can use that information in help determining the project's overall cost. They can also be examined to determine whether there's hidden constraints which were not previously known. For example, if a commonly shared lab is only made available for certain times during the month, then it becomes a scheduling constraint that may not have been previously identified. Now let's move on to the project charter's budget section. The project charter's budget is a preliminary high-level budget. Remember, no planning activities have yet begun on the project. The project manager has only been brought on to the project. So allocating funds to specific activities or tasks is not possible at this point. That comes later in the process. At this point, we're only looking to determine what the overall budget is and whether there's any pre-existing constraints on those funds. For example, money may have already been allocated to a specific division within the company. A specific vendor may have already been selected or a supplier may have already been selected that, that the project must use. These type of constraints should be made available at this point. Also, you can give general guidelines for how money is to be allocated. For example, if the client wants the bulk of the money uh, at a social event allocated towards the reception as opposed to the event itself, these type of guidelines can be given during this preliminary budget. However, you would not expect to see cost breakdowns for example, specific amount of money towards labor or materials or on entertainment or how much the taxes for the event will cost. This type of detailed information comes later during the planning phase of the project when the project manager can begin to break down the, the activities on the project and, and allocate funds towards each activity. That comes later in the project. Let's take a look at another section where we define the project manager's level of authority. In this section, the strategy is to ensure that you clearly understand the difference between authority and responsibility. We all know that the project managers will be given responsibility to conduct tasks, but in this section, you need to define what authority they have to fulfill those tasks. So let's now take a look at the final section, the approval and sign-off. We all agree that the three primary stakeholders, the client or the sponsor, the organization representative and the project manager have to sign up to this framework agreeing that they will conduct the project as per specified in the charter. But you need more within their section. You need a clear statement as to what it is they're agreeing to when they sign up to the charter. So include in this section two parts. Obviously a signature block where the stakeholders can sign up, but also include a statement of some kind as to what they are agreeing to when they sign their names. Now let's examine the need to have a professional writing style while preparing your project charter. You need to be able to convey your ideas in a clear, concise, professional format. For example, let's take a look at the statement, we require a short turnaround for this project, you need to deliver in 60 days. This appears to be a clear, concise statement, but as project managers we see that this statement is not clear. For example, do you refer to 60 calendar days, as I've shown here on this diagram, or are you referring to 60 working days, which is 90 calendar days, more if statutory holidays appear over this time period? Or are you referring to 60 days of effort? Depending on the project, the number of workers available, and other factors, 60 days of effort could be applied over a very short period of time, or could be applied by having a very few number of workers work part-time on the project, and apply the 60 days over a considerably long period of time. So as you can see, considerable amount of thought has to be given to the way you rephrase requirements so that they are not open to interpretation. Now let's take a look at the need to provide supporting information in each section so that assumptions are not required. Now let's suppose you're a project manager and you've been tasked with hosting a conference or an event of some kind and your client has come to you and have stated that they require a list of all the names of the attendees and participants at the event. Without clarifying this operational requirement, you may make assumptions on what technical requirements will be needed to support this operational requirement. For example, will this list of names be part of an information system? Will it be web-enabled? 
Will the list need to be accessed by mobile devices? What type of database do you need? How will you ensure data integrity, protection from the hackers? You might be overwhelmed at this point with potential technical requirements. But the key is to clarify the operational requirement first. If you go back to the client and ask for clarification of the operational requirement, you might find that the client's true intent is merely to raffle off some artwork that they have to those who show up at the event. In which case, rather than an information system, you really only need some pens, some cards, and a box to hold the draw in, which is completely different from your initial assumptions. This underscores the importance of making sure that you are very clear in all of your operational requirements. And thus we have reached the end of the presentation. Hopefully there was some useful information in it for you, enough to get you started on your project charter. Keep in mind that to maximize your marks on this assignment, you should follow the, the provided template and attempt each section. This assignment represents a chance for you to de demonstrate your ability to address each section within the charter and an opportunity to receive feedback on your work. Always keep in mind the period of time within the project life cycle that the project charter is produced and how it will be used later on in the project. This will help you determine what information would be available and relevant for inclusion in the charter. I hope this video has provided you some relevant, useful, and beneficial information for you. And if you have any questions remaining, please feel free to email me. I'm always happy to respond. I also really look forward to the opportunity to provide you some feedback on your assignment and I wish you all the success on this assignment.